Great job, praise and worship team, uh, tonight. I mean, if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Philippians 3, and we'll be reading from verse 13. Now, I do just have to apologize to some of the guys, um, those that come to Serious Men's. Um, this was a Serious Men's uh, a few uh, last month, um, so I do need to apologize to you guys, but I really believe it's going to help the church as well. Um, you know, just as I was praying, laying a hold of God, uh, you know, this is just really going to help uh, members of the congregation as well. So that's, um, so Philippians 3, Li Fu Yan, he had suffered years of severe headaches, bad breath after being stabbed in the head by a robber. Four years went by and he couldn't work out what was happening. Why am I getting these headaches? Why, you know, brush my teeth so many times or whatever? Why, why is this happening? He eventually went to the hospital, and after an x-ray, it was discovered that he had a four-inch blade lodged in his head from the attack. Four years he had been living with a blade wedged in his head. Now, that's not the only story of people getting knives stuck in them from, you know, robberies, etc., etc. But it was removed, and eventually he recovered. Now, many times in life, we walk around functioning with a knife lodged in our heads, not knowing why we feel the way we feel, why we're thinking the way we think. Because of past hurts, some people are unable to move on. Because the knife has been wedged in people's minds, there is, they are unable to press forward. And we need to go to God. We need to talk about these berry blades. We need to go to him like you would go to a trusted doctor, nurse, medical uh, expert. I mean, we need to believe God to speak to people tonight. There's people here, no doubt, that you have things from your past that are still hurting there's knives wedged in your head, so to speak, but God is going to set you free tonight. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to these things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This sermon is entitled Removing the Knife. Let's first to consider a wedge knife. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if life was just plain sailing? That there was no issues to face, that there was no problems, everything just works out the way we want it to work out. The family is peaceful, there's bliss in the family home, no discord between, you know, between us and others, no discord between church members. We have enough money in the bank to keep us afloat and also to allow us to live a nice life. We go on holiday to a nice sunny destination, maybe once, maybe twice a year. You know, just, just nothing, just nothing to worry about. The richest man in the world is Elon Musk. The CEO and co-founder of Tesla, CEO, leader, designer, and founder of SpaceX, CEO and founder of Neuralink, and the founder of the Boeing company with an estimated net worth of $197 billion. Here is a man, right? Here is a man who can literally afford anything he wants. If he wants it, he can have it. So much so, just the other day he released, or just the other month, so he released an electronic music soundtrack if you've heard it it's terrible but he released it just because he could why not I've got nothing else well he's got lots to do but you know he released it and it didn't go down very well <laughs> however we are never going to be as rich as Elon Musk right let's be honest with ourselves some of okay we're never going to be as rich as this guy Life isn't always going to be plain sailing. It takes turns. It, you know, it takes us ways that we don't expect. Things happen that we're not planning for. Whilst there are great parts to life, there are also some horrible parts that stay with us 
for a long time, like a knife wedged in our heads. The problem is some people are unable to diagnose the issue. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Some of you, if not all of us, have a knife wedged in our head. We all have a past. However, some have the knife deeper than others. It affects life. It affects how you process things. It affects your relationships with other people. It affects how you react to certain situations. We want to consider how the knife gets there because it doesn't just end up there one day, right? Li Fu Yan was stabbed in the head. So number one, what you have personally done in life. You know, we're not angels. None of us here are perfect. We've all done things that we're not proud of. We've said things that we wish we could retract. In the moment of rage, in the moment of disappointment, of sadness, actions have been taken which has caused possibly separation, maybe hurt someone, and we blame ourselves. Some people, substance abuse, alcohol intake, whatever it is, there is something that you personally feel responsible for. I was speaking to someone on the streets before, and they, they basically said, you know, I can't be forgiven because of all of the things that I've done in my past. And we consider Judas. He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And when, when he saw what his actions had done, he went and hung himself, blamed himself, couldn't see a way out, and took his own life. Matthew 27, verse 5, then he, drew, uh, then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. The second reason is what others has, have done to you. People can be wicked, right? Their motives, their comments, what people say, how people act around you. You hear stories of kids getting sexually abused by someone older than them, and that event sticks with them the rest of their life. The knife has gone in, and they're unable to process things properly. Maybe some of you have been in a situation, have been in that situation. Others, parents who have disowned you, friends who have deserted, jobs where you've been unfairly dismissed, and now you're in financial crisis. Stephen Crowder, he's uh, an American-Canadian conser conservative political commentator. From time to time, he goes to universities and does something called change my mind. He basically puts up this statement, uh, a very controversial subject, and he wants people to sit down with him, discuss it, and try to change his mind. One of them, he said, rape culture is a myth. He got talking to a lady on the campus and she had been raped herself and she went off the rail at him. The knife had been put into her head because of someone else, but it affected her whole life. Even in church, dare I say, people can betray you with their speech. People can betray you with their actions. Friendships can be destroyed by actions that have been taken. And the problem with this is we begin to blame ourselves for that very issue. But it's not always your fault. Someone else has caused you harm, whether that physical or emotional, but the knife has been wedged in to your head. And then the third reason is life happens. Life has a way of throwing curveballs our way from time to time. Something that we didn't expect. A phone call from a doctor telling you bad news. The death of a loved one. The loss of a job. The snowball effect. One bad thing after another. And you, you're left thinking, what on earth is happening? Before Chantelle and I came back from Southampton, life wasn't going as planned, right? We went out as every pioneer does. We went out with vision. We went out with you know, yeah, we're going to take Southampton for Jesus. We're going to have disciples. We're going to have fruit. Da, 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 da. But, you know, that didn't happen. There were times when I thought 
I, there were times when, and I'm being honest with you guys, there's times when I set up for service, we'd done the song service, no one came in, I put the guitar down and I said to Chantella, what is the point in us being here? Why am I standing here and just singing to my family? <laughs> Life was wedging a knife into my head. See, maybe you're walking around life patched up with so many plasters trying to cover the wounds. But the knife is wedged deep, causing you many problems. No matter what you do, the wound is never covered up. Max uh, Lucado, in his book Grace, he writes this. He says, what would an x-ray of, uh, of your interior reveal? Regrets over teenage relationship, remorse over a poor choice, shame about a marriage that didn't work, a habit that you couldn't quit, a temptation you didn't resist, or the courage you couldn't find. Guilt lies hidden beneath the surface, uh, festering, irritating, sometimes so deeply embedded you don't know the cause. You become moody, cranky. You're prone to overreact. You're angry, irritable. You can be touchy, understandable since, you've, uh, since you have had... Uh, sorry, since you have had a shank of shame lodged in your soul. So we all have past and problems that we, problems that we face, but some people are simply unable to forgive themselves, unable to move on from the things that have happened, and you let your past dictate your future. Consider Paul, the writer of Philippians, our text, he was a smart man. He was a religious leader, Acts 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that one, uh, that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out to the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Even though this was the case, once Jesus came onto the scene, no, he's a religious guy, but even though when Jesus came onto the scene, started, people started getting saved, people began to get healed, delivered, he was not happy. He persecuted the Jews. He went out and he, he went to find them to deliver them to the court. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. People laid their coats at the feet of Paul. Acts 7 verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man they, called, they named Saul. Saul was Paul before his conversion. Right before his conversion, he was on the way to find and persecute Christians. Acts 1 verse, uh, sorry, Acts 9, 1 to 2, then Saul still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that it was found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's done some pretty horrific things. He hasn't had a clean sheet from the past, yet God was still able to use his life. So we want to secondly consider removing the knife. You know, I heard a story, uh, a 17-year-old boy who was stabbed in the chest and his, le and his leg, and as a result, he was left blind, unable to speak, and he was paralyzed. See, the truth about having a knife lodged in your mind is that it paralyzes you. You're unable to move on from that very situation, that people get stuck in the past. They get bitter, they get twisted, about the things that happen to them. They get stuck, unable to process life. You know, they say, I remember what happened to me all those years ago. The moment a name is mentioned to you, the moment that situation arises, there's anger, there's frustration, there's tears. Different emotions fill your body and you get paralyzed in that moment again. Holding on to the past is not healthy for you. And I'm not here to belittle any, any situation that has happened to you. But one man said it hurts your present and can ruin your future. 
Every moment you spend dwelling on your past is every second of your present you are missing. It's an article that says, living in the past causes negative thoughts that not only affect your mind, but also your health. They can lead to stress, anxiety, depression, insomnia, obesity, and anorexia. See, in our text, Paul is writing from prison to the church at Philippi. He's encouraging them in this letter. He has a past, but he understands that while he has not yet arrived, he is still pressing on to the future that God has for him. He understands that he's been forgiven. He's moved on from what he did in the past. If you like, the knife has been removed from his mind. Verse 12 to 13, not that I have already uh, attained or that I, or that, sorry, or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid, laid hold for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So let me ask you a question. Can you identify any knives in your life that are affecting your present and future? So you must allow God to remove them. C.S. Lewis said, you can't go back and change the, the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. See, God is able to heal the wounds, church, if you allow him to. So from our text, we want to learn lessons from Paul's life. How do we remove past hurts? Number one, we need to press on. Verse 14 I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. See, the past can hurt, but we must press forward and not allow the past to hinder our relationship with God because there is a prize that is awaiting for us. The call of God is bigger than the things that have happened to you in the past. Paul in verse 13 says that he reaches forward He's not letting anything stop him moving forward. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrendered, or so, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So we must run the race, church. When we get stuck in the past, we're putting on the weights instead of giving them to God. Number two, following good examples. Verse 17 says, brethren, join in, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul challenges the church in, in Philippi, the Philippians, to pursue Christ-likeness by following his example. See, when we follow good examples, we can see how life is to be lived. We can see how to make things work in life. Situations arise, how did that person deal with it? And we can learn lessons, how to be discipled, how to learn to navigate the storms of life. You have somebody you can reference from. See, are you following good godly examples or are you following the person on the OK magazine? When Pastor Brown was here uh, a few months ago, my eldest daughter, she mistook him for Pastor Buddy. And I think Pearl even ran up to him and hugged his leg, looked up, oh, you're not granddad. <laughs> It's been said that Pastor Holt could be Pastor Body's son, that Pastor Louis and Pastor Danny are the same people. <laughs> See, I'm not saying today that you become a clone and you, you know, but I'm saying that you follow examples, that you have somebody you can replicate from. You have somebody that you can focus. And number three, we need to focus on heaven. Verse 20 to 21, for our citizenship is in heaven. For which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed in, uh, to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to 
even to subdue all things to himself. See, what happens here on earth, church, is merely superficial. Yes, it can be painful. Yes, it can cause sorrow. Yes, it can cause heartache. But this is not our final destination. That we are pilgrims. We are simply passing through. First Peter 2 verse 11, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So this is not all in life. What we have here is not everything in life. One day, we will make heaven our home. You will get a new, glorious body. Some of you say, praise God. The issues that you face here on earth will vanish. The heartaches, the problems. Revelations 21 verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the, old, for the old order of things have passed away. Church, you have to focus on heaven. And number four, you have to stand fast. Philippians 4 verse 1, Therefore, my beloved, and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. See, to stand fast is to firmly remain in the same position, to hold on to what you believe, to trust God through the trials and tribulations of life, to fix, uh, trust God to fix up the past hurts, the inner Christian life. There will be things that come against us. There will be the enemy. There will be situations of life. The devil will assault and try and take you and I out of the race. The past can haunt us. However, when you stand fast in the Lord, he is able to keep you. Remember that he is your shelter. He is your fortress, your firm foundation that you can trust in what he says about you. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the, uh, until the day of Jesus Christ. See, God is working in each and every one of you. Each and every one of us, God is doing something. We go through ups and downs. We go through trials. We have to let go of the past because God is going to finish the work that he started in you. So let's finally consider living a knife-free life. When people get stuck in the past, they become very short-sighted. As Christians, we are called to keep our eyes and focus on Christ. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the problem is when we focus on the past hurts, we take our eyes off Christ. And as a result, we only see the problems. We only see the hurts. We only see the issues that are causing us pain. We lose our vision. We know what the scripture says about a future and a hope that Christ has for you, yet we erase ourselves from the picture. No, I can never have that. Look at all the problems that I have. Look at the problems I have in the past. How can God possibly bring restoration to my life? How can he heal the wounds? They go too deep. But church, God is with you. He changes Paul from being a Christian persecutor to being a preacher of the gospel. God is able to cover the wounds, heal you from the past. Yes, it may take time, but it can happen for you. You know, look around you for a moment. Everyone here has had things happen, yet we've been healed from something. But there can still be people sitting in our midst, new convert older saints with deep wounds in your life, unable to press forward, unable to move on. But let me declare it to you today, church, that God can make a way. Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers 
in the desert. So if you want to live a knife-free knife life, you must fix your eyes upon Christ. You must learn how to rejoice. Philippians 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The word rejoice is to be well, to thrive and to be glad. No more do you have to live in the shame. No more do you have to live in the guilt from your past, but you can le learn and live rejoicing in God. You're able to see the blessings of God that he, upon your life, see where God has brought you from and see what he has done for you, that he is able to fill you with such a joy that the scars from the past, the deep wounds in the past, can be healed with the joy of the Lord. And then we need to remember that the Lord is at hand. Philippians 4, verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So what does that mean? Well, it means that God is near you. That you are not on your own when it comes to the battles of life, that God is at hand. The children of Israel, they've been set free from Egypt. They've gone through the Red Sea and, and things have happened. And God led them. A pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. This is a picture of God being with you and I. Matthew 28 verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and though I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So no matter how difficult life becomes, you can always overcome things because God is with you. You don't have to be anxious. Philippians 4 verse 6 is be anxious for nothing. I used to work with people who were incredibly anxious. They'd come up, we'd sign them in for their appointment. They'd come up looking over their shoulder, panicking. Oh, is the pen being cleaned? They, some people had their own pens, just worried and scared and anxious about everything in life. But you don't have to be anxious about your past. That God wants to help you to overcome that you can bring your past before God tonight and allow him to heal you. And we need to pray and be thankful. Philippians 4, 6, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. See, bring it to God. The things that have kept you paralyzed. The knife that has been stuck and wedged in your, into your head for years. Bring it to God. Allow him to comfort you. Allow him to do surgery on your mind and bring healing to your soul. And what follows is the peace of God. And I close. Philippians 4 verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you can have peace on your mind, peace over your life, in your life. Where you were restless, you can find rest. God is able to guard you from the things of the past. The things that try to hold you down, God is able to bring a peace into your life. I close with this commentary. It says, Paul had reason to forget the past. He had held the coats for those who had stoned Stephen. We, all, uh, we have all done things which we are ashamed. And we live in the tension of what... We have been and what we want to be. Because our hope is in Christ, however, we can let go of the past guilt and look forward to what God, uh, for what God will help us over, uh, become. Don't dwell on the past. Instead, grow in the knowledge of God by concentrating on your relationship with him now. Realize that you are forgiven and then move on to the life and faith of obedience. Look forward to a fuller and more meaningful life because your hope is in Christ.